These true crime stories involve cases that were solved years later, providing families with closure and most importantly, ensuring the criminals are caught before they can commit any more truly dark and disturbing crimes. Number 5. One of Maryland's darkest true crime cases was recently solved after more than 50 years, making the mystery of James Tappan Hall the oldest cold case ever solved by Montgomery County Police. It was October 23, 1971 when Captain James Hall left his Rockville, Maryland home for what would be the final time. He worked as a police officer, as was tradition in his family, and also a security guard at the Manor County Club. That night, James was supposed to be off-duty from both of his jobs. He was enjoying a family meal with his visiting daughter and her kids. Plans changed after he agreed to fill in for a patrol officer who couldn't make their shift. At 10.40 p.m. that night, police received a call from a person who had found James lying face down and unconscious in a parking garage with a bullet wound. He would pass away three days later in the hospital, according to media stories. Crime investigators were determined to crack this disturbing case against a fellow police officer. They believed the true motive behind this crime could be related to a home burglary that James might have possibly disturbed and paid for with his life. Over the next few years, countless interviews took place, but the true story was that all crime leads had been followed up on. Finally, on the 50th anniversary of James's passing, the unsolved case was handed to the cold case unit for solving. The team looked through all the crime scene evidence. A big part of their criminal investigation into this unexplained mystery was reviewing old tapes of police interviews with suspects for any new information. One of those interviewed was a man named Larry David Becker, 19 years old at the time and with a criminal record that included burglaries. Police suspected he might help them get the case solved, but Becker didn't provide them with anything they didn't already know. When the cold case unit reviewed the tapes again decades later, they realized that Larry had let slip certain details about the case that the general public would not have known. For example, he somehow knew how many times the weapon had gone off that night. As they investigated more deeply into the case, they found that he'd left the state not long after James lost his life. Larry had also changed his surname to Smith. The case was solved after detectives caught up to him in New York and he made a criminal confession to taking James's life. According to his narrative, the crime unfolded while on his way back to his car with stolen goods. According to Smith, he had fired at the police officer, who later turned out to be James, but allegedly had no intentions of taking his life. The criminal confession and the cold case team's work finally closed the case, and Smith now faces trial for his crimes. Number 4 just hours after one of the worst blizzards the Northeast had ever seen, the Tesheri family in Buffalo, New York, were hit with a tragedy that none were prepared for. 18-year-old Howard Tesheri found the body of his older sister in her carriage house and stumbled across a true crime story that wouldn't be solved for 40 years. Linda Tesheri was 19 years old in 1978. She lived alone in a carriage house behind her family home where her mother and brother still lived. She went to bartending school and was just starting out her adult life when it was brutally taken from her. At 8 a.m. on the morning of February 8th, Howard and his mother saw a man walking away from Linda's home. It was too far to make out for certain, but they assumed it was Linda's boyfriend and thought nothing of it. But when neither of them had heard from Linda at all that day, Howard was set to go check on his sister. He soon found her lying on the floor in her living room. She'd been struck many times with a sharp object in a terrifying attack. Police soon arrived and the criminal investigation into this dark mystery began. Crime scene investigators were quickly able to piece together what had happened. Linda had been woken by the attacker and the attack itself started in her bedroom. It's not clear if Linda went herself to check the living room trying to escape or if she was taken there by the attacker. She might have fought and during the attack, the criminal suffered a wound. 
After the attack, he wandered around the home before leaving. Witnesses described a plain-looking man getting into a dark green Chevy Nova. Police were able to collect DNA samples they believed belonged to the criminal, but in 1978 there was little they could do with it. They believed the best line for the criminal investigation was to contact hospitals and doctor's offices. They believed the criminal would be seeking medical treatment for his wound, but that turned up no new leads. The case went cold and it wasn't until 2007 when the local cold case team picked it up. DNA samples collected at the time were analyzed, but they weren't eligible to be uploaded to the national database until 2019. It was then that the police found their match. The DNA matched a sample given by John Soberin, who lived about a mile from the Tesheri home. He also had two close friends with a dark green Chevy Nova. He didn't know Linda and there was no reason for his DNA to be in her home. Soberin was arrested in 2020 but pleaded not guilty. His defense tried to claim the DNA could have been contaminated, but the jury did not believe this and he was found guilty in this dark and disturbing mystery. Number 3 The advancement of DNA technology allowed investigators to solve a dark and mysterious cold case 35 years later. The case was that of Mary McLaughlin, a 58-year-old mother of 11 living in Glasgow in 1984. The last night of Mary's life was September 26, 1984. Mary spent the evening at a pub with one of her daughters, who left to catch the bus home. Later, she would say that her mother still had her wits about her as Mary began the walk back to her apartment. Along the way, Mary stopped to buy some food and cigarettes. She was spotted by a taxi driver walking alone, and the cab driver thought he spotted a second individual going the same way, possibly following her. These darkest moments are believed to be the last time Mary was seen alive. Six days later, one of her sons came for a visit, as they did about once a week. His mother didn't answer the door. There was a bad smell coming from the apartment, and he had to break down the door. To his horror, he found a true crime scene inside. Someone had wrapped Mary's own gown around her neck. At the time of the true crime story, a man named Graham McGill who had a history of attacking women, was serving a six-year prison sentence. He was on temporary release as part of a program to help prisoners transition into society. It had been the final day of this special release when the notorious individual bumped into Mary and offered to walk her home. Mary saw no problem with allowing a young gentleman to walk her home. It was only once he was inside the apartment that McGill turned vicious. By the time Mary's body was found, McGill was finishing the last few weeks of his prison sentence. He would go back to prison for various crime stories, many times before Mary's case caught up to it. In 2014, cold case investigators ran a DNA test on the robe through a criminal database, hoping for a match. There wasn't much forensic evidence at the time, but it helped keep the case alive. Years later, recent breakthroughs in DNA technology have advanced and helped science enough for investigators to create a genetic profile of the criminal. The DNA results now pointed towards McGill. McGill's ex-wife also came forward with more information to help see his case solved. He'd confessed to her that he'd taken a woman's life because he wanted to know what it felt like. He added that he was surprised by how long it had taken. McGill pleaded not guilty in court but was found guilty and will likely spend the rest of his life behind bars. Number 2 Joette Smith was a well-loved member of the Ben Lamond community in California. She had lots of friends and a lot of potential suitors, but was dedicated to a restaurant and didn't have time for dating. What happened to Joette Smith would remain an unsolved mystery until her case was solved decades later. It was 11.50 p.m. on March 27, 1983, when Joette was last seen alive. She had spent the evening with her housemate in a small studio apartment across the road from her restaurant. After her housemate Rachel retired for the night, Joette walked outside to buy cigarettes. She made it to a bar just before closing. One of the employees offered her a ride home, but Joette said that it was a nice night and didn't mind walking. 
She left at 11.50 p.m. Joette's missing body was found almost 36 hours later by a man walking his dog along the San Lorenzo River. She was found floating in a body of water and had gotten snagged downstream on a tree branch. Joette was found still wearing her pearl necklace, a stocking, and a boot when she was discovered. Criminal investigators found the remainder of her clothes discarded near a bridge. Initially, police had two possible suspects in mind to explain what happened to Joette. One was a man who had gotten into a car accident with Joette not long before the crime took place. The other was a notorious individual known to have attacked a woman shortly before the mystery of Joette. Eric Drummond was identified as a suspect. If their leads were true, crime investigators discovered Eric had suspiciously asked out Joette not long before she had her life taken. Joette rejected him and furthermore, they found Drummond had a violent history and had previously been in prison for attacking women, even attempting to take the life of one of them. However, there was only circumstantial evidence linking him to the crime, a story that even if true would not hold up under the scrutiny of trial. It wasn't until 2022 that DNA evidence found on Joette's clothes was analyzed. Through forensic testing, police established a DNA profile of the criminal responsible. Sure enough, the DNA from the crime scene evidence matched that of Eric Drummond. Investigators knew that they had their criminal, and with that, one of their toughest cases was solved. Drummond passed away before he could face justice for the crime, but police confirmed this dark and disturbing mystery had finally come to an unexpected ending much later. Number 1 25-year-old Chris Farmer and 24-year-old Peta Frampton were traveling around the world when two British tourists suddenly disappeared without a trace. Their families were left with few clues to go on, and three separate investigations into the disappearance made solving this cold case especially difficult for crime detectives. The last anybody heard from Chris and Peta was a letter from Peta at the end of June of 1978. They were in Belize and had met an American man named Silas Duane Boston, a man with two children named Vince and Russell. He'd offered to take the couple on his sailing boat, the Justin B, where they would ride down the coast to Honduras in exchange for $500. It was a bargain for the young couple and they had decided to go on the adventure. When a few months passed and there was no word from the couple, Chris's father contacted the harbor master in Belize City to ask what had happened with the Justin B. He was told that the names of Chris and Peta were found on the crew list when they left port but they seemed to be strangely missing from the list by the time the boat reached Honduras. Working with the foreign office, Silas Dwayne Boston was tracked down in the US and interviewed by case detectives. He claimed to have dropped off the couple somewhere in Guatemala. If the stories he told crime investigators were true, then he had assumed the couple had made their way home from Guatemala. As Chris and Peta's family continued to spread the stories regarding their missing loved ones, Investigators eventually discovered another dark mystery in Guatemala. Fishermen had found the bodies of two Europeans on the beach in early July. When the bodies were found, missing were all of their clothes and they were covered in marks. Furthermore, they'd been weighed down by engine parts. Though the bodies were initially identified by case detectives, dental records now confirmed the missing people were indeed Chris and Peta. Still, it would take another three decades for their cases to be solved. During this time, Silas had mysteriously disappeared from detectives. Finally, Chris's sister reached out to Silas's son, Vince, and Russell on Facebook. They'd only been children at the time of the crime, but they remembered what happened on that day to the two missing people. Through social media, Chris's sister learned that her missing brother had met an unexpected ending after he had stood up to Silas, who was intoxicated and bullying the kids. Twice, Silas had tried to attack Chris in retaliation, at one point falling overboard himself. On the third time, after a disturbing struggle, Silas managed to tie up the couple and throw them overboard. His two boys had tried to tell the authorities in the US and in London about the darkest moments of their lives, but instead of a crime investigation, their stories were not taken seriously 
and the case was not solved until years later. In 2015, the cold case was finally solved after being taken to Interpol experts. Around this time was when Interpol agents were contacted by American investigators who were working on the criminal investigation into the strange disappearance of Silas's third wife and wanted to learn more about the cold case involving the mysterious disappearances of Chris and Peta. With detectives working on the case from both sides of the Atlantic, the dark mystery was close to being solved. Silas was arrested, but before he could face criminal trial, he passed away due to natural causes. Even though he never faced justice, the case can finally be closed. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.